everyone. Can we please welcome Peter Jackson with the Rebirth? Close. Oh, sorry. I, don't know. I have nowhere near that much filmmaking talent. <laughs> uh, someone was talking about Peter Jackson. <laughs> anyway, um, could we please welcome Adam Jackson <laughs> with the Rebirth of Xenorama? All right, so I'm going to be talking about Xenorama, which is sort of a poorly understood concept for a lot of users, I get the feeling. Um, with some reason, it means several different things, and so I'm going to be talking about what it is and what each of the pieces are, why it's still important, and some of the work that I've been doing and that I hope the rest of the community will be behind me on, on uh, making it something that we can continue to use and why it's still important and, and all that good stuff. So in order to talk about Xenorama, you have to understand some of the backstory of the X protocol and its notion of a screen. This was written all way, way back, like 20 some years ago, about graphics cards that were, we didn't even have the term GPU yet. And so it made sense to kind of you know, codify the assumptions of what a GPU had and what a GPU meant. And for almost without exception, a GPU had one output attached to it, and that was sort of your minimum unit of addressability. There was no point in trying to talk about something smaller than a GPU. There was no distinction. So X maps internally to its implementation a GPU and a screen rack is this internal data structure that describes how big the screen is and what its visuals are and a bunch of function pointers that describe how to render on it that's very tightly bound to a GPU. And so it's basically, you can think of a screen rack as a driver instance. I'm going to say it a lot because that's the word for it internally, but it's a driver instance. And the server also maps a screen rack very, very closely with a protocol screen, which is the, the Y part of display equals colon X dot Y. These are considered to be kind of heterogeneous. Uh, nothing really is guaranteed between two screens. The only thing that you're guaranteed to be able to do on two different screens is uh, some bitmaps. They're both going to, going to support one BPP bitmaps. The input device is going to float across them, and your input focus is going to go with it. Actually, Keith is shaking my, his head at me, but close enough. Um, there's no, not even any defined geometry among those screens, though. Windows stick to the screen they're created on because they're potentially different. They have different pixel formats. They may be different, laid out differently. And so rather than define any rules for how to translate arbit between arbitrary screens, they just said, well, we'll solve that later. Let's get it working first. So almost all other X objects are per screen objects. Pix maps, which are off screen rendering storage, per screen. Graphics context, which describe their pen color and the stipple that you're drawing through and all those other uh, concepts, per screen, because they talk about visuals, which are a description of the pixel formats that are allowed on a screen. So they're all very independent kind of things. They don't really talk to each other. And the problem is that's not really what you want. Uh, we have a mode for this, a term for this in, in X. It's called Zaphod mode for obvious reasons. They're just kind of independent heads. They don't really talk to each other. Um, and this actually works kind of OK once you're at like the two head case because you might have you know, your high quality true color frame buffer on one screen that's your, the output of your CAD program and then the drawing interface, the, the control interface for it on this fast 8-bit uh, or monochrome protocol screen off to the side. So it helps a little bit because you can kind of establish a geometry between them. It works okay for about two. Once you start getting any bigger than that, it rapidly becomes awkward to talk about individual screens all of which are independent. You can't get windows from one screen to another, so you can't have this big display wall kind of configuration. You can't have uh, flight simulators that take up 40 feet of space. It doesn't work. So what if you just want the one big head? Well, within this sort of 1998 model of what a graphics card was, Xenorama does that. Uh, Xenorama is a split layer. It comes right in off the protocol as, as requests come into the system. That kind of breaks things up 
makes them appear on different screen recs, and makes that all get glued together as one. It's actually two things. It's this rendering multiplexer, so your request comes in from the client application and translates rendering requests from where they are in this kind of glor you know, unified client visible view of uh, where your screen objects are and translates that relative to each screen rec, each driver instance, so that the pixels show up in the right place. Uh, it also has a kind of an object management layer. There's, there's, proc there's objects inside the X server for Windows, pix maps, color maps, graphics contexts, all these other things. Almost all of these have per screen state. Uh, they can be represented arbitrarily on different driver instances. So we have this proxy object in the middle that says, oh, you mean pixmap number three. Screen zero thinks of that pixmap this way. Screen zero, screen one thinks of it a different way. I'm going to make sure that they both know that they're the same thing. When, they, when I draw to one from the client's view, it, that happens on both of them. And the other half of Xenorama is a geometry protocol. It's a very, very dumb protocol. It's basically just descriptive. It says, is Xenorama active? Which is sort of redundant, because you would think if this extension is listed at all, it's active. And if it's not, then it's not. But it's there. And it says, how many screens do I have? And I put screens in quotes because it's an overloaded term. But how many rectangles worth of stuff do I have? How big are they? Where are they relative to each other? All things that CoreX did not allow you to do. In the Brazil sense, uh, rendering multiplexer is information retrieval where you go beat up the, uh, the, the protocol to make it do what you want. And the geometry protocol is information dispersal where it tells you about all the changes it just did. So here's the problem. That implementation was written when you only had one output per screen rack, because that's all your hardware had in 1998. When render 1.2 is active, you have Protocol more like, uh, we, we fake up Xenorama for the simple case of you've got one GPU. We fake up just the protocol to say your CRTC is here, your CRTC is here. These things are, they look like Xenorama, kind of, so we're just going to fake this protocol so that applications that were written to Xenorama continue to work. This fake Xenorama protocol is only smart enough to work over the one screen rack because we just didn't try hard enough. So if you want both of these things, if you want multiple GPUs in your system that are managed with, the, with render internally, they have CR multiple output paths that can all be independently described, and you want to have multiple GPUs, each of which participates in this kind of consistent global view, you don't get it. It does not work right now. Uh, you get one of the two protocol implementations. I forget which. Regardless, you get an inconsistent view of the world, and it doesn't really work the way you want it. So clearly, the first thing we need to do in order to get this to work is we need to fix the protocol. Uh, so what I've implemented is sort of the straightforward thing. You have a new record, a new method that hangs off the screen rack, which is the driver instance, that says, hey, driver, tell me about your output rectangles. If you have a simple driver, like most of them, most of them want that we don't consider render 1.2 drivers, then you just get the one rectangle back, and there's a, a portable implementation that does this. The render implementation returns one box per CRTC. In principle, some other driver could hook into the same infrastructure and give you twin view views back as well. OK, I don't really care. Uh, the Xenorama protocol code will walk that list of rectangles instead, so now you get this whole consistent view of all of the independently addressable pieces of glass on the system, all the displays that you might want to be talking about. And of course, some people are still going to want Zaphod mode because they're weird. So if you do that, the Xenorama protocol goes away entirely. We just don't even pretend. You'll still get render protocol for each screen. So, screen, so protocol screen 0 will say, I have these two CRTCs. Protocol screen 1 will say, I have these other two CRTCs. But they'll be independent. So great, now it's good, we can go home. <laughs> Multiplexer is garbage. Um, it really does not attempt to be fast in any way. Uh, there's some very simple mechanical problems for this. The way it's written is it interjects itself right at the top level of protocol dispatch so, you get, so that it can kind of reuse 
against each of the backend screens the same code that was using before. So you're not really, you don't have to teach each driver about Xenorama. You just kind of hide it in this one abstraction layer. So you've got an additional function pointer lookup on every request because you have screen zero's ID, idea of what, that, of what this request is, screen one. The root window pix map, which is where all your pixels get stored, has to be created on all the screen racks, and it has to be the size of the whole screen, which means if you have a eight kilopixel wide sum dis uh, total display, that root window pix map has to exist that large on every single one. Um, you can fix this, but things like the Nautilus background image, you can't really slice that up because that has to get created whole. There's no way to, to break that up at the moment. But the really the hard, pro the, the worst part of it is, is that all these pro all these proxy objects, everything that has to be instantiated once per screen, is done so in the most naive fashion, all up front. And most of your rendering happens to pix maps. Most of your rendering happens, you know, I draw a scene in a GDK window, but I'm doing that to an off-screen pix map, filling in everything, and then copying from that to the front window, and so that it doesn't flicker as much because X's rendering model isn't good. And then throwing away that pixmap at the end. Now that final copy only goes to the window, which only goes to the one screen that it appears on, which is usually only the one. Pixmap rendering, we don't know where that rendering is going yet. It could be anywhere. So every pixmap is instantiated once on every GPU. So your performance gets linearly worse as you add GPUs to the system. Uh, this, is, this is linear in a sense. Not really good linear. So looking into this, I, I thought I, I should figure out how bad this is. You know, where is the slowdown? So uh, turn on Xenorama just for one screen rec and see how much slower that is than having a single screen without the Xenorama multiplexer on. And this is what I get. You know, it's a little bit strange. Um, I have to explain this graph a bit. The red bars are, it's this normalized copy area performance, which is just basically a memory bandwidth intensive operation. Imagine blitting around between screens. Red bar is Xenorama off, which, mean, which is why it's one all the way across. Blue bar is Xenorama across one screen. And orange bar is Xenorama across two screens. And at the bottom, this is the size, 500 squared, 100 squared how big of a region I'm blitting, and W and P are window and pix map, so it depends, you know, it's telling me from a window to a pix map, or from a pix map to a window. Now you would expect, given what I just said, that these numbers would be consistently worse for Xenorama at all times, that there would be this additional overhead involved just in getting the request to the screen rack, which is true for kind of the large operations. Uh, and anything involving from a window to a pix map. But as you get towards these small operations at the right side, 10 by 10 square, 10 by 10 square, it actually starts getting faster in some scenarios, just for turning the Xenorama multiplexer on, but not actually changing the screen configuration. So pix map to pix map and pix map to window operations are slower, which you'd expect, because the pix map actually exists on every screen, and the window doesn't. So you have to act, and so you have to go across every screen to do the split. Window to window operations are comparable because when they, because the window actually fits all on the one screen. So when the second operation happens, it just gets clipped away because n no drawing is actually happening here. Window to pix map ops are unreasonably lame because now I'm going from this one window operation out to all the pix maps on all the backing screens which means I'm doing n times more work. But the multiplexer isn't that much overhead on its own for a lot of the, uh, for a lot of the rendering ops in the middle. It's basically the same, and some things it actually makes faster. So why is that? Uh, I'm looking up proxy objects, like at least another two hash table lookups on every request. I allocate a scratch buffer, because each screen rec is allowed to mangle the request buffer as it comes in. I copy the protocol into that look up the per screen objects, call the per screen dispatch, and then free the scratch buffer at the end. Who wants to guess why this is faster? Anyone? No? All right. 
prefetch. You're actually loading that mem copy gets the request into the cache. Uh, 10 by 10 outline rectangles end up being the fastest. And this is just comparing between uh, a normal, these are the kind of the 10 best improvement cases uh, from going from Zenorama off to Zenorama on with just one screen. 10 by 10 squared outlined rectangles get almost 10 times faster because now all the request buffer fits in the cache. Hooray. That's only like 4K of data. So apparently cache line missions really hurt. All right, so it's just pix maps that are the problem. We need to do something more intelligent than creating a pix map on every screen rack. So that's what we'll do. Uh, create it on one screen initially instead of y'all. Guess the initial screen from the related drawable. Uh, when you create a pix map, uh, this is the one bit of code you're going to have to look at the whole time. You have a display, a relative drawable, and then the width, height, and depth of the pix map you want to create. Well, the relative drawable in a Zaphod mode situation says which screen you expect this to be on in the protocol sense. In a, Zenorama, in a Zenorama world, there's only the one protocol screen, so it doesn't help me if you say, oh, relative to the root window. But it does help me if you say, relative to this Firefox window. Because then I, I, then I have an idea of where that Firefox window lives in the screen geometry. I can create my pix map on that GPU and not the other ones send the rendering to it as long as I need it, and then when I copy out pixels out of that pix map to somewhere else, hopefully I don't have to cross GPUs. If I do, I just pull the image down, and that'll be slow, but it's faster than what we're already doing. Uh, in the future, you might like to tear down, a pic if a pix map ends up being instantiated on multiple screens, eventually one of them is going to be, you know, if I move the Firefox window from this screen to this screen, this one no longer needs it, so I can just tear it down there at some point. And some kind of better protocol for hinting the right initial screen. Uh, we fixed Cairo to do this sensibly, so that when you create surface similar, it will go to the right screen rack. Um, but that's not necessarily uh, enough information. So at least we've got a plan there. What else doesn't work about turning Zenorama on? Well, render doesn't quite work. Uh, there's this copy concept of a source-only picture in render, which is a solid fill or a gradient. And those never got Zenorama proxy objects. When we added those to render, we, didn't, we only added them to render for one screen. We didn't add the proxy layer for getting them to onto all the screens. The fixes extension doesn't quite work. There, uh, when you define a clipping region in a graphics context, the clip region is needs to get proxied to, need, that needs to get replicated to the graphics context on every backend screen, and it doesn't. Composite doesn't work either, because you're creating, the way composite works is every window, instead of having this one shared buffer for storage, gets its own pix map, and then a compositing manager pulls bits out of that later and draws them somehow. To do that, you need to create the backing pix map on every screen rack, because we are instantiating it everywhere. Except in DMX2, this all actually does work. Uh, there's DMX2 is this project that Novell wrote and they called, as part of a larger effort called Nomad, which allows you to migrate your session to anywhere. You know, you've got an X server running, you view it on your machine here, and then you can also view it on your machine at your desk back in Boston, and it works. Which is kind of cool, except that the DMX2 code was literally just dropped on the world and then they walked away from it. And so I scraped it out. Thanks for putting it in Git, at least. So I didn't have to write it again. But way to get stuff merged. So that's some progress. Composite's going to scale really badly uh, because we have every window has its own backing pix map now. So now every single drawable has you know all the all the linear scalability problems we had. Before, just on you know sending pix map rendering to every screen is now n times worse. You can try to fix this by looking at where the window is on the screen and instantiating the backing pix map on, on you know which GPU that window lives on, and only putting the backing pix map there first. Okay, that works for automatic compositing or any simple non-transformative compositor that just kind of puts the bits where they are. 
But a compositor can draw an arbitrary scene. Imagine, you know, the spinny cube thing. The windows don't actually get moved in that environment. They just they are just being drawn in different places. So you can't trust any sort of PixMap hints we get from the application about where windows should live because the compositor could potentially draw a, you know, it, something that logically belongs on GPU 0 on my right, gets represented on GPU 1 on my left, and now I have to slurp the bits out of that GPU's memory and get them over here. Whose idea of placement are you supposed to trust about that? Also, the compositor can't predict the future. Where the windows are correctly now, if they're all in the right place, like near the right GPU, that doesn't prevent me from doing the film strip and needing all the pix maps on all the GPUs at some point in the near future. I do not have a good answer for this, uh, but I think we're going to have to come up with something. I think that probably, you know, we're going to have to look at the GPU, the, give the compositor enough information to say, these are the GPUs where things belong. Or, you know, tell, have to have the compositor tell us these are where some windows are probably going to be in the future. But even that, I think we're going to still run into some, poor, some performance cliffs when things need to be in two places at once. OpenGL has real trouble in this situation. Um, because now you're doing hardware dependent rendering, you need a, a driver that's specific to each GPU. And what does the concept of direct rendering even mean? Indirect OpenGL stands a, a plausible chance of working. Uh, indirect GL is where the client, like all the other X rendering, sends some rendering requests to the X server, the X server does them. In direct GL, there's this cutout where you just talk straight to the kernel to get your bits on the screen. So there's kind of two strategies you can do for OpenGL. You can either do this kind of subsetting operation where you look at all your backend screens, pick the lowest common OpenGL version, intersection of all the extensions you've got, create the proxy, uh, create the context everywhere, maybe try to create drawables lazily, maybe. Uh, it'll, it, you could make that work. Um, the other option is to pick one backend GPU to do all your OpenGL on, which is, I think, what you get in Windows in some situations. And then what do the other GPUs get? Do you try to, you know, once you've rendered a scene to the front to, you know, swap the buffer in, if you drag that window across GPU boundaries, what happens? Does, do you try to copy the bits out? Do you try to get, or do you just draw blanks? And I think you get blanks in Windows. You just get a black square. Also, if you do this, how do you pick which GPU to put it on? Oh, the fastest one. Oh, yeah, because we can tell that. Um, if I have two current generation video cards, one of which is NVIDIA and one of which is Radeon, how do, you can't even say which one is faster. So, and obviously every GPU is going to say, I'm the fastest thing in the world. So you can't just like put some score on, you have to pick one, and it's not really clear how you do that. Direct rendering is much, much, much worse because now your application, all these applica uh, the application has been written not to DRI, it's been written to GLX. GLX doesn't have any notion of multiple GPUs. G GLX just gives you a renderer and says, here's some stuff to do with it. So if I create a direct rendering context, the OpenGL implementation in the client needs to be able to hide this entirely, either we do all the same kind of subsetting that we do that we would do to make indirect GLX work, or if you have homogeneous GPUs like a Crossfire or SLI kind of configuration, then you could reasonably say, okay, that driver knows how to deal with this scenario and move on from that. But if you have heterogeneous GPUs, this is really, really awkward because now all that complicated multiplexing work that the server kind of already knows how to do, you have to do on the client side as well. I have no idea how to deal with any of the other direct rendered APIs. Cairo is not direct rendered yet, kind of. Uh, somebody would have to think about this. I, I don't have any good answer for what to do in that situation. Rander is one of the other extensions that needs some modification to deal with this new kind of integrated protocol. It's not enough to just change Xenorama 
to speak about this, the same pro, you know, the same objects, a consistent view of objects across all screen recs, the render implementation needs to be Zenorama aware sort of intrinsically whether or not the multiplexer is active. There's a concept of a primary output, which is completely straightforward. Windows has this, Mac OS has this. In Mac OS, it's, you, you get the multiple monitor configuration tool, uh, and you click on the title bar and drag it to a certain monitor, and that's the one that gets the menu bar. Same thing exists so that GNOME knows where to put the panels. That concept is currently implemented per screen rec, which is clearly wrong because a par, you know, primary output on a single GPU on GPU 1, primary output on GPU 2, this is the wrong view of the world. I need to have that primary output concept kind of centrally located. The list of modes in the server. Modes are not are like the primary output. They are not a screen-dependent concept. They are just this global list of names of mode timings. So you need to collect, and you can get to them from the protocol, so you need to collect them across out of all the screen recs. The protocol screen geometry needs to be multiplexer aware so that you know um, I need to tell you a different view of the world. If I'm the only one, if I'm the only rendered GPU active on the system at all, if I'm the only GPU, it doesn't matter which copy of the screen geometry I use, but I need to be careful to only give you my geometry instead of the screen, instead of the whole display's geometry. The GPU still has rendering limits. Uh, you can only accelerate rendering out to so large on any given GPU. On this one, thankfully, this is a, a 960, Intel 965 chip, which means I can render to something that's 4,000 by 4,000, 4096 in each direction. On, in, on NVIDIA chips and ATI chips, now it's 8,000. OK, but I can bolt enough of these GPUs together in one machine to get past that really easily. Worse than that, I can now, if I've got this unified view of the world, uh, where all the geometry is kind of shared relative to each other, I can have one graphics card. I can have, say, I have, say I have two graphics cards to make this, the example easy. And I put one of them in the center. It's only got one output. And I put the other one on either side so that they, you know, screen zero over here, screen, screen two over here, and screen one in the middle. But these two are driven by the same graphics chip. It's going to have one big allocation for all these pixels. And now it's real easy to make that be bigger than the accelerated rendering limits for that graphics chip. And man, is that slow. Uh, I've, I've done this on a Radeon chip. And what ends up happening is you end up doing software-driven rendering to across the PCI bus on basically every pixel. And video cards don't like to have their pixels read back out of them. They're write-only devices. So it's now very, very easy to get past this rendering limit. And you might want to not do that. You, it's, it's, it's even easier. Uh, there's, there's another limit here, which I didn't draw, I didn't put on the slides, which is the scan-out hardware has a similar kind of limit. The scan-out hardware can only go to an image buffer so big. On the 915, you can scan out of a buffer that's 4,000 pixels wide, but only accelerate rendering to a buffer that's 2,000 pixels wide. But now it's really easy to put them 5,000 apart, and I physically can't, I can't set that up. The graphics chip does, will not do it. Other than those things, yeah, it works. It's great. There's no other real problems in, in fixing the R&R protocol for this. Now, the multiplexer also doesn't scale. And this is a little bit, of a, a little bit more theoretical, but it does happen. Max screens defines the maximum number of screen recs, driver instances, that I'm allowed to have on a single system. Uh, it's 16 right now. It could be anything. But I need one proxy object for each screen rec. I create a window from the, from the protocol's view. I need one proxy object on one, one real window on each screen rec, yes? They, yes, they do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How do you look them up, then? The assertion? Right. Stop ruining the slide. <laughs> right, now, the, right now, the way you look them up 
is you do a normal resource lookup. You say, I want this XID and this type. And that gives you the window, you know, or the, the actual window that corresponds to the proxy window. This would work a lot better if the XID wasn't exposed to the app, to the drive, to the screen rack at all. Because right now it is in the drawable, in the drawable, which is either a pixel map or a window, the ID is a, is a member of that structure. So when you look it up, that's the only thing you have, that's the handle you have to look it up by. Now the proxy object could just have a list of pointers to all the backend objects, it doesn't. And so since you need to create XIDs to correspond to all these proxy objects, eventually you can run out. Uh, if you have a really big screen set up and you have a lot of clients, you'll only be able to create 64,000 XIDs instead of like 2 million. And it's not actually that hard to come up with an application that needs 64,000 XIDs. So this clearly will not work either. So the plan, what do I want to do to make this all work? Uh, unify the Xenorama protocol, so I've got one implementation of it among, that's the only thing that's allowed to publish this protocol. And fix the screen rec so that I can get each driver instance to tell me its own geometry. Merge in all the multiplexer fixes from DMX2. Uh, fix the, the, the little bugs in R&R &R to make it multiplexer aware so that you have, you know, primary and modes are properly uh, server global rather than screen global. Allow the multiplexer to be enabled even if you've only got one screen rec on in the system just to, you know, to prove that it works and that you can get OpenGL at least for the simple cases. You know, I've got, oh, I've only got one back end screen. There's no reason to turn GLX off in that scenario. And then probably try to do uh, lazy PixMap creation with the naive hint about where it's supposed to go. And I'm going to try to get that done for approximately uh, 1.9, because apparently 1.8 is supposed to be in a uh, fixed freeze right now, feature freeze, I'm told. In the future, and this is sort of in, in priority order of what to do, uh, the indirect GLX multiplex uh, subsetting work we have a lot of the code for that already. The DMX server has its own OpenGL implementation. Thank you, SGI. And so a lot of the code to do this subsetting already exists. So it shouldn't be too difficult to at least get indirect GLX working the same way that PixMaps work now. There, you know, it'll go kind of create drawables everywhere, draw to all the screens, but at least it'll go. Turn the multiplexing layer on all the time, because why not? Apparently, it makes some things faster. Um, there might be a code size argument for embedded systems to compile it out, but I really don't care that much. It's, it's, it's a text section. It's fine. It can get swapped out. Uh, I would like to move each screen rec to have its own thread to maximize the amount of parallelism you can get in drawing. Right now, since we're literally serialized on one thread, you have to submit rendering to each GPU in sequence and it's not that bad for DRM-based drivers because the way DRM drawing works is you build up a list of commands, and you hand it down to the kernel, the kernel hands it off to a DMA engine on the car that runs it, and sometime later you can ask for the results back or not, or you can just wait for your buffer. So as long as you've got room in the command buffer to keep submitting commands, it scales pretty okay. Um, but if you ever need to get the results back, you have to wait. You'd really rather not do that. The static screen array, we have this, this array of max screens big that says how many screens you can ever have. Uh, this is really awkward if you try to do screen hot plugging because you would like to have just the handle to the screen and not have it worry about whether it thinks it's screen zero or screen one or screen two. What does that number even mean? What do you think is the third USB device on your laptop? It doesn't make any difference. Um, and part of this is because hot plug GPUs are a very real thing. Uh, several laptop manufacturers now are, sub are building docks that are just USB connected. You have one USB cable that runs out of the machine, plugs into the dock, it's got a video card, it's got a Ethernet controller, another USB hub, sound, 
all that stuff that you expect to be on a dock on the other end of USB, which means there's another graphics chip out there. And we should be treating that like another GPU, plugging it in. Uh, in, the, in Dave's talk earlier, hot plug, uh, there's another case of GPU hot plug that was mentioned, which is, uh, like my laptop has, the speed stamina switch to let you pick which graphics chip you're using. Uh, this one has an Intel chip and an NVIDIA chip. And it's basically the same thing. You have two G, from X's perspective, you have two GPUs. You bring up both of them, but just one of them you don't configure any screens on. And so you have the Zinorama multiplexer active, ready to go. You've asked each one what capabilities it has, so you can do, you know, present the right OpenGL extension list and everything. And when you want to switch, you just stop dispatching, you unplug one screen rec and plug the other one in. And that's how I would solve this. These XID and the screen rec really need to be divorced from each other. The idea of the protocol visible resource ID being something that the driver knows about at all is utterly, utterly broken. There are very few cases where the driver needs to know that at all. I can't think of any where the driver needs to know it. I can think of a couple where an extension needs to know it. DRI needs to know this for a couple cases, so it can map between a drawable and the gem buffer handle. But that's about it. So in as many cases as possible, we should be divorcing the XID, the, the client visible resource ID number, from any internal representation of that object. Uh, do the lazy PixMap garbage collection trick. Uh, once you've moved a window from point A to point B, you're no longer using the results of that PixMap on any other uh, on any other screen, so it can just get garbage collected away. This may or may not be necessary. GTK, at least, PixMaps don't live very long. Most PixMaps get created the size of the window they're going into. You draw into them, you blip forward, and you throw it away. So as long as you get that guess right in a lot of situations, then client side, then client picks maps don't really need too much knowledge about migration. Composite, however, does have this problem. If I move a composited, a redirected window from one, one GPU to another, the pixels need to follow it. I can't, I'm not allowed to, well, Windows I could lose picks maps, but, uh, but the, you know, it's probably worthwhile to migrate them between GPUs rather than try to have the, the clients regenerate them. Or maybe not. I don't really know. Uh, the PixMap creation hints, I have, this is a, an interesting problem, like whose idea of, uh, of locality should I believe, uh, especially given that anything I say can be false in milliseconds based on you know, the user dragging windows around. And then the direct GLX thing, I'd like to see this done purely for crossfire, homogeneous GPU setups at least, um, just because that's a reasonable situation. If you're being unreasonable and putting a Mach 64 and a Radeon in the same machine and expecting them both to have OpenGL, perhaps you should not get very good OpenGL. So I've actually blazed through this reasonably quickly. Uh, there's not a whole lot left to say. I'll take any questions you've got, but basically, I'm trying to give you a pony with a puppy on it. And I think we can do a lot of this. I think we can actually make it pretty reasonable. So, any questions? In the current uh, Xenora Mac code, I've been trying to have a two by two screen, so four LCDs. Mm -hmm. um, and because there were NVIDIA cards and two, basically four Xenora Mac screens was very slow, I did twin view and then Xenora Mac to twin view, mm -hmm. uh, which kind of works. Of course, it has some big memory leaks, and everyone's pointing fingers at other people. Um, is Xenorama supposed to be able to be doing four screens now or soon with what the work you're doing? Most of that slowdown is due to the PixMap uh, rendering performance issues that I mentioned. Yeah. Um, the, Zener the, the NVIDIA driver reuses the protocol multiplex, the, the rendering multiplexer uses exactly the same one as the open drivers. They don't implement their own, uh, they don't implement their own rendering multiplexer. Which means that every time you render something, you have to do it in both places. You have a lot of PixMaps that are very, very large. Um, 
So really the question of is it supposed to be able to do two by two is, uh, it, is how many screen is the same as one by four? How many screens is it supposed to scale to? It's in a lot of cases it's pretty much linear. It's going to depend on exactly how many GPUs you have in the system and how much uh, and how much copying. <laughs>
<laughs> well, I had a Summer of Code student looking at Shatter, uh, and we ran into some pretty severe difficulty with that. Shatter, for those of you who weren't here for LCA last year or who haven't seen this, the talk or heard me promise it for a year, is essentially the idea of working around rendering limits on, uh, acceleration limits on the GPU. And you do this by rather, you know, if I've got a 4,000 pixel limit and the application wants to create a 5,000 pixel wide surface, don't do that. Break it in two, send the rendering to each piece independently, and then kind of stitch things back together. The hardest part of this actually turns out to be shattering rendering to the root window. The root window is this there is a very magical thing in the way the X server code is written currently. It's not created like any other pix map. It's created in sort of two stages where I set up a description of it and then I allocate it and bang the pointer to the memory into the root window. And so you want to shatter the root window pix map when if I've got on a 915, if I've got two uh, if I've got two screens that together sum to more than 2048 wide. I want two backing PIX maps for it rather than one. And the way that that's, the, the, the way that that's structured internally is really, really difficult to do. The, the code to actually walk the rendering are Extracted away. The, the operating system is responsible for presenting kind of a, uh, that view independently. And Shatter gets, is, gets you most of the way there, actually. Shatter is most of the way towards that kind of, or you know, envisioning that kind of vision of the drivers really only talking to some, read, some block of pixels according to some rules, and the core server code is responsible for actually breaking those pieces up. So yes, that would be lovely. Trying. Um, if there's any other questions, I think that um, maybe you could continue them outside. Yeah, certainly. Here's a gift on behalf of LCA. Thank you.